All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Crypto 101 podcast. I am joined today by Adam Jackson, the CEO of Braintrust. Adam has been on the podcast and Digital Currency Summits many times. Uh, we can't get enough of this guy because he's so full of great information. We had to have him back yet again. Adam, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me back. I, I know I'm, I'm usually full of something. Hopefully, it'll be good information today. Well, we'll roll the dice and uh, see what we get. Let's start with uh, your background first for the, those of uh, you out there who maybe have been living under a rock and have not read about you just yet. Um, who you are? Who are you? What do you do? And what have you built? Yeah, for sure. So uh, Adam Jackson, co-founder of Brain Trust. Um, quick background. I'm, I'm a software engineer by training, studied computer science at Vanderbilt University, uh, moved out here to San Francisco right out of school. So it was 16, 17 years ago. It's been a while. Uh, seen all the ups and downs here. Um, but working on my fourth venture backed project, I'm sort of an engineer turned entrepreneur, um, all marketplace businesses, but all in different categories. My first one was an e-commerce marketplace acquired by Intuit, then an automotive marketplace acquired by Advanced Auto Parts. Uh, then in 2012, I started Doctor on Demand, which is a large video telemedicine service, not quite a marketplace, but it connects doctors and patients for live uh, consultations. And then um, Got into crypto full time in 2016 ish around there and um, built uh, co founded a crypto hedge fund called Cambrian Asset Management and then uh, spun Brain Trust out of that fund. Um, and Brain Trust, uh, you know, we're now, you know, into our fourth year is a decentralized talent marketplace that connects knowledge workers with clients that need their services. And we do so in a really fee disruptive way because Brain Trust is a crypto network. It's not a for-profit corporation and it's owned and controlled by the talent who make their living on the network. And because of that, it can charge very low fees, disruptively low. So 0% fee to talent, 10% fee to clients. And what that does is it brings in the best talent from around the world because they got better economics. And then wherever the talent go, clients follow them. So the network's grown really quickly with that new kind of ownership model uh, powered by this new technology, blockchain tokens. When I first heard of Brain Trust, I thought it was going to be something like uh, a new government entity like the CIA. And I went to apply to like this, you know, new think tank or whatever it was going to be. And I found out it was a job hiring platform. And I was like, oh, shit, I'm on. Sorry to let you down. <laughs> yeah. But as I started looking more into it, I realized just how novel it is. And, you know, learning about your background, you're a guy that brings people together and you know how to really match supply and demand very well. So what was it about these other businesses that you did? I mean, you, honestly, you don't have to work for a living anymore if you don't want to. You can just be off on an island somewhere sipping martinis. But what is it that keeps you inspired to keep building, especially here in crypto? Well, yeah, it, it's true. Believe it or not, I do choose to do this uh, with my time, which uh, some days I wake up and wonder if, if that was really the right choice. But uh, <laughs> I, I am very passionate about letting global talent like access opportunity everywhere, right? The old saying, talent is dispersed equally around the world. Opportunity is not. And I come up in this world. I'm from you know, Northern Ohio, where there was not a lot of opportunity. I moved to California where there was a lot. And because that, when I came here, there was, that was the only way you can kind of, you know, dip, dip into the Silicon Valley ecosystem. And, you know, you'd have a network with the Sand Hill crowd and the Silver, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. And it, it all seemed unfair to me, right? And, and restrictive on both sides, right? Not everybody wants to live in New York and California, especially these days. And um, companies would love to hire talent all over the world. They don't want to be restricted to just one, you know, one or two very expensive economic zones. And so um, in, in building two-sided web-enabled marketplaces, literally my whole career, I realized like the dirty little secret with a corporate-owned marketplace is that the marketplace's job is to extract more and more fees out of the network, right? Raise the rake, raise the fees, take more dollars out of every transaction. And while that might sound good to shareholders, that it's it's actually like the better you get at it, the more misaligned the incentives become between the folks who make their living on the network and the people who own and operate the network, right? And then the, the further misaligned those incentives become, the more of an incentive there is to disrupt, right? To, to you know, get rid of the corporate middleman, so to speak. And so when, when I discovered blockchain tokens, I was like, wow, this is 
you know, a, a totally new technology that allows tens of millions more and more people around the world to organize essentially a global co-op, right? And to, to build a network that is essentially software driven, does not have to, does not have the mandate of extracting more value from its users every year and can keep incentives aligned and thus grow faster, right? So the, the big idea here, this was an investment thesis at first and now, now it's just like an operating principle is like user owned networks will grow faster and be more valuable than investor or corporate owned networks. And so that's what we've been proven out here with brain trust. And that's, that's what I'm passionate about. That's what gets me out of bed every day. And it's something that actually strikes a chord in my heart. Cause when I joked earlier that I was unhirable, there's a lot of truth and pain behind that because before I got into crypto, it really was a struggle. I didn't last a job longer than two years other than refereeing roller hockey in my entire life. And I've signed up on every job board you can imagine. Indeed, Monster, Cyber Coders, whatever it was. And all they really would ask me when I would fill out these things is, where'd you go to school? And who'd you work for in the past? And maybe a couple other random questions that you know no one really cared about. Then it would want me to upload my resume anyway. So I'm like, why am I filling out a questionnaire and sending a resume that has all these answers in it? And the only responses I would ever get were from a couple recruiters that lived 9,000 miles away and could barely speak English. And we're just sending out mass emails to literally everyone. Didn't even land one interview in God knows how many decades I was on any of these platforms, despite being very well versed as a system administrator. I worked for private security firms that destroyed, you know, entire cities on the internet at will. And I worked my way up there as a social engineer. So there was a lot I could offer to any company uh, just from my experience that I couldn't put on a resume. But had they taken the time to even talk to me, I could have shown them some things that were very impressive. But what is it a brain trust that makes things so different that allows people's, you know, unique talents to really shine through and find a good match? What are the values that brain trust can highlight on that platform versus a lot of these legacy things? I, I, I love that path, by the way, so, social engineer turned investor and podcaster. It, make, makes, it makes a lot of sense, actually. Uh, well, if I had planned it, it would have been. This is <laughs> literally like <laughs> the last page before suicide. And it just happened to be the right one for me, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. It all worked out. I guess I had to reach rock bottom to find my real path. Oh, so, many cave. so many of us do. I mean, I mean, look, I... I I, you touched on a couple of very salient points there. First of all, like legacy credentials are meaningless. Where you went to school, if you went to college at all, completely meaningless. I have a computer science degree from Vanderbilt. Basically, all it is is a receipt for a bunch of fucking student debt that I had to pay off. And fortunately, unfortunately, I paid mine off before the government you know, relaxed all those loans. But wah, wah. yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Bad on me. But, um, you know, the point is like we now live in this like super competitive global environment where knowledge workers from around the world can become really good at something self-taught basically for free. You can learn anything you want on YouTube. You can learn by doing all, all of this knowledge is free, right? You do not need to pay for some credential, whatever. And so th that is the, one of the core uh, values behind brain trust is this it's an egalitarian network. Anyone can show up. You have to, it's rigorous to, so you have to prove you know what you know, right? If you claim you're a level five Python developer, you're going to go through a screening process, full synchronous and asynchronous. You're going to go through KYC to make sure you are who you say you are. But one of those questions is not where you went to school or what kind of degree you got or where where you got it from. It just doesn't matter, right? And that, that those are um, anachronisms in this new world of, of knowledge workers. And so if you can, if you can do what you say you can do and, um, uh, get through the screening process. You can, you know, make a great living on Brain Trust. Um, you, you know, we have a native token called the B Trust token, which uh, f folks can earn by referring more of their friends and networks or clients. I mean, eighty percent of the network has been grown just by community referrals. Um, we're rolling out a professional network now where you can actually redeem those tokens you've earned for further upskilling, networking, career mentorship 
bespoke advice, like things from more senior people, not, not something you could like type into Google or even chat GPT and get a real answer. This, this is like real mentorship. So the token economy at brain trust is what is making it grow so quickly, right? You go to the professional network, you upskill, you refer people to earn more tokens. You can go buy them if you want to, but we'd rather you do things to earn them, right? It creates this virtuous cycle. It's all merit-based. Uh, one, one of the ways we're using, we'll be utilizing the blockchain is, you know, if you do a great job for, say, Goldman Sachs or Bank of America, two of the bigger clients on Brain Trust, um, it, it's provable, verifiable work history, right? It's like, hey, I, I, I have proven uh, on Brain Trust that I've earned, you know, X, you know, two hundred thousand dollars, you know, building software for Goldman Sachs, right? That that's a real, that's a credential, right? Like that, Goldman Sachs is a high standard. Shipping enterprise software for a bank is a real professional badge. This isn't like lying about some club you were in on LinkedIn or some bullshit like that, right? So this, again, like the, the world's talent is spread all over the world. Like whether you live in India or Oklahoma or South Africa or New York City, like it's, it matters if you can do the job and if you have done, verifiably have done the work for these clients. This is the new economy. Yeah, and the new economy really is user-owned networks. That's what Web3 really is. It's user-owned networks. And brain trust is something that I often reference as a case study for Web 2.5. And the difference between that is you've got a centralized management team and a centralized legal entity that is overseeing a user controlled network. So it's kind of a bridge from the traditional corporation model on the way towards being Web 3. And it's, as, it's very, there's it's many... Very Oh, sorry, I just want to clarify. Real, it, it's it's yes. very close to that. So it's not it's not one centralized company overseeing. It's actually like six or seven companies that all they're they're. I only own one of them, right? One of the founding nodes. There are mm -hmm. six, five, six other nodes, depending on how active they're being in a given month. That you know help bring on clients, help process fiat payments. I mean, it's it's important in a decentralized architecture that. If any one of these nodes went away, like if my if I disappear tomorrow, if my node disappears, other other nodes around the network could pick up those client transfers, could pay the talent, could do other things. I don't own and control the other nodes. I only own and control mine. Now, when we started, I think that maybe the point you're making, when we started in 2018, 2019, yes, it was just my one company. And then we brought other community members came in and they brought their companies and their bank accounts and their relationships uh, with clients and we all come together to form a decentralized network but we we started centralized and we're on this path of progressive decentralization with which frankly that's the point of of blockchain right that's the point yes and i think web 2.5 is a more accurate it's a it's a more apt term for this actually yes as you started it was web 2.5 and on the path to decentralization which is web 3 where you're at today so and then that's tremendous. And I like any Web2 company or legacy brand out there that wants to get to Web3 to study the brain trust model and what you guys have done, because I think you've done a tremendous job at it where there really was no blueprint before. But just through being very knowledgeable and ethical, uh, you guys have made the journey in, you know, four or five years. Uh, so great, great on you guys. And, you know, what do you think? else is really ripe for disruption in the user-owned network space? You know, is it going to be Amazon Web Services? Is it going to be Netflix? You know, what do you see, you know, really being disrupted next? Yeah, the, I, I love I love this topic. This is one of the things I'm most passionate about as you know, an early stage backer of projects, as an operator in the space, contributor to other DAOs and networks. It, follow the money, follow the margin. Wherever there's a lot of margin in a centralized service, there's probably a decentralized network that can do a better job at a better price, right? So I look at the role of web, web enabled marketplaces on a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum are marketplaces that, ex, that, that provide or give back just as much value or more value than they extract. On the other end of the spectrum are marketplaces that extract more value then they provide their users. So everything on this, the more extractive end of the spectrum, ripe for disruption. I'll just give you quick examples. On, on the good end, right? The, the not likely to be disrupted soon end because they provide so much value, I would, I would say Airbnb, right? So Airbnb took 
you know, this very disparate world of vacation rentals where there was no trust, no safety, no price discovery, no liquidity. Yeah, it was just a shot in the dark, right? It was just a very unpleasant experience compared to a hotel. Ryan comes in, builds this new platform, easy to use, gets liquidity on both sides, makes it easy price discovery, provides insurance, background checks, uh, protection if something bad happens, that, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, he's made a platform now when he's taking about 20, I think it's 20% is the fee and people are happy to pay it, right? I mean, they may, may bitch about it, but like they do pay it and it does grow because it's a much better experience than calling some random guy in South Lake Tahoe and hoping the vacation rental doesn't have a grizzly bear living in it or something. So, you know, and you, you come out, he comes out of the other end of that 12 month, 12 years later, and he's got more rooms than Marriott does uh, on the, so I don't see like a web three Airbnb anytime soon. On the other end of the spectrum, you have marketplaces that are extracting more value than they're providing. Great examples, gig economy, DoorDash, Uber, um, big big consulting and staffing firms, you know, that that take talent and mark them up three times and rent them out to big companies, right? That's where Braintrust plays, right? Braintrust doesn't compete with like Upwork and Fiverr. Those are very small jobs, $200 logos here and there. Braintrust is a, mostly an enterprise grade network providing, you know, really high skilled people or mid, mid range people to clients that have insatiable demand for them, which are traditionally the, you know, where, where staffing firms come in and say, yeah, I'll rent you 50 de job developers and we're going to pay them 75 bucks an hour. We're going to charge you 250 bucks an hour, right? That's a big spread. Great. That's why Braintrust grows so fast. That's a great economic disruption opportunity. Uh, DoorDash, another example. DoorDash is an amazing app. Right. It's a credible value uh, for the consumer, but they're marking up the food. They're uh, extracting a lot from the driver, from the dasher and the restaurant. I mean, so much so it's like restaurants will ask you not to use DoorDash sometimes. Right. It's a great indicator that we need to we need to use our own last mile network. Right. For folks who deliver other people packages and food. Right. What, what an amazing thing where you could have a tokenized network of those folks around the world and then any any client that needs those things delivered can just tap into that network directly. Right. And, and so that, to me, to me, that's like the next iteration of, you know, where user own networks should go. Yeah. We've seen uh, a decentralized Airbnb come and go in 2019, uh, 2018. I saw the first uh, attempt to be an Uber without Uber and that didn't get off the ground. And I think a lot of it has to do with brand building. There's some amazing tech builders in this space, some of the best in the world, but their strength is development, not marketing, not brand recognition. If you want to build a, a normal brand up in legacy markets, you raise a series B and you throw that hundred million dollars into Google ads and just let it run on autopilot. Or you hire someone like the illusion factory to build you a Super Bowl commercial. But in web three, you have to build a community of people who are not just your customers, but your owners and your participants, um, everyone is kind of in this together. What are some ways that you're building your community in Web3 and brain trust to continue growing that brand to become the next household name in you know, 5, 10, 20 years? Yeah, the, 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 those are great examples of where just good engineering or product is not enough, right? Because here's the thing, Uber and DoorDash are amazing products. The economics are wrong, but the, the products are incredible. So having an incredible product is just your, that's table stakes. It's not enough, right? I mean, I like, yeah. like take Twitter, Blue Sky, right? Like D Dorsey's an amazing guy, he's an amazing product guy, but Blue Sky looks exactly like Twitter. That's not going to disrupt Twitter, <laughs> no. Actually, I don't think anything. I remember when Uber came out, I got spammed in every email address I ever had for like two years with nothing but just become an Uber driver. Exactly. So, so look, to, to answer your question, look, you need to, to build a new marketplace and gain market share quickly and be truly disruptive. You need an unfair advantage. My, my prior company, Dr. On Demand, my co-founder was Dr. Phil from TV. The therapist, the you know, a TV show that reached 32 million people a week. He was our unfair advantage. We talked about the service on his television show. That's how we broke orbit. And then we grew, 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 grew. The unfair advantage in token economies is the native token. So it, you, you, you reward, you create a permissionless economy where anyone can come and participate without gaming the system. I'll, I'll just use brain trust token economy as an example, because it's what I think about every day, but I think it could be a valuable blueprint for other verticals. So 
Branch has created its own uh, native token, which is used to govern. It's it's built on compound governance. It's a governance. It started as a governance token. Now it can be redeemed for career services and you know uh, career help, mentorship, etc. It has lots of uses now. But we the protocol distributes the token to anyone who refers new clients and new talent. So we have now hundreds of folks we call connectors, which these are like, they're like very well connected people that, you know, they probably have day jobs or whatever, but they're, they have vast networks of either talent or clients or both. And in their like spare couple hours a month, they'll send emails referring these parties into brain trust using their unique code. And then when those parties get through and start transacting like Nike or Nestle or Bank of America, or, you know, these are all referred companies. The connector then gets this constant stream of token bonuses sent to them by the protocol. And th then they can, you know, they're accruing this token kind of passively just for, you know, inviting more talent or going inviting more clients. That's how we've grown to, you know, thousands of clients and hundreds of thousands of talent in such a short time. And th that in, its, in and of itself, builds a community, right? Now you have all these stakeholders in the network who, you know, want to see it grow or, or, or you know, re referring business, you know, as a side gig. We see these uh, unemployment numbers now that our loving government puts out every month and says, oh, you know, the economy is recovering so much. Yet the Uber drivers that, you know, I'm involved in whenever I'm going to the airports, they're usually people that were retired and no longer can afford to be or, you know, in some cases, you know, very professional people that would be earning a six figure salary where that's not enough, or now this is the only job that they can find. Um, so it's, it's a, a slippery slope to say, are we really recovering? And still, you know, we see on the news all the time, this top company is laying off 10,000 employees. This company's laying off 8,000 as you know, we're here in uh, almost the middle of 2023 when we're recording this. But what are your clients that are looking to hire asking you for right now in terms of features or talent uh, or fee or, you know, just on the network? How are, you know, big companies thinking about the, the markets right now? Uh, sure. Market? Um, so I'll, I'll start by saying probably half of the big companies on brain trust are under a hiring freeze. So, you know, th this this slowdown is real. I don't think it's unthaw thawing out. I think we've still got a lot more pain to go. I think we've got inflation that will keep rising. Um, the, the unemployment figures are skewed, right? It's just, it, it's, it's just not, I, I don't think the numbers are accurate, but um, in, in the knowledge worker space and the IT space, we're feeling the most pain here, right? With the, this, there's been hundreds of thousands of folks laid off in the last two quarters uh, in the U S I think just in California. And, um, Every day you hear about another round of layoffs, usually in the tens of thousands of folks from a, a big tech company or whatever, uh, and then countless more startups or, you know, series B companies either slashing in half or going out of business completely because global liquidity has dried up. This is, you know, we're in a high rate and higher rate environment now. Uh, global macro is risk off. Liquidity is dried up. Venture has ground to a halt. That means but, you know, folks get laid off. And so uh, on brain trust, you know, we, we've been lucky enough to, to still remain growing through this, not, not nearly growing as quickly as, as we were a year ago, but still, you know, month over month, quarter over quarter, adding more companies, adding more uh, jobs and, and what they're looking for. I mean, it's, it's nothing special. I mean, it's, you can go look at the, the brain trust marketplace anytime and see it's, you know, UX designers, software engineers, product managers, project managers, backend DevOps folks, um, systems engineers, AI, ML people, now now prompt engineers, right? Folks that can help implement Bard or ChatGPT to make a business more efficient, right? They couldn't have had better timing with, with that technology coming out. Um, I don't think that stuff's going to replace any people, but it's going to make existing folks, you know, 50% or whatever more efficient. Uh, and that that's a hot topic right now is how do we streamline and make our folks uh, give them an Iron Man suit rather than lay them off? Yeah. And I think that's a great way to segue. Let's talk about AI because there is a lot of fear that it's going to take people's jobs or replace humanity. But the AI we see coming out of stealth right now, there's literally thousands 
that are just popping up everywhere. So that tells me a couple things. One, this is just a bunch of things that already existed that are being rebranded AI that really aren't. And in order to do that, they're calling it generative AI, meaning that this thing can, you know, use some artificial intelligence to maybe manipulate a photo or translate voice to text or something very, very simple. These are not fully autonomous where with all beings that are able to challenge God. Nowhere even close. They wouldn't even be able to, you know, recreate a Super Mario level in 8-bit uh, and follow all the game theory physics in you know from Super Nintendo at this point. So I don't think there's a lot to worry about. Do you see it the same way, or how how do you approach AI? At the I, I have look. I have the same view. And 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 look, I studied machine learning in college. I I love the science behind this. I'm when I hack around at night, it's it's with things like this before open AI and all that stuff. Right. I've I've been playing with TensorFlow for years and. Look, a couple of things. One, it's the domain of large companies that have tons of data, right? So we use AI every single day. Zoom uses it to, you know, make your image look a little nicer in your meeting. And Google uses it to filter spam. And Facebook uses it to target ads on Instagram better, which they're amazing at. Um, these uh, natural language interfaces to the LLMs, yeah, it's it's a parlor trick, right? I mean, it's it. it I think it's a productivity hack for sure. If you're a writer. Um, if, if you, especially if you're a writer, you should really be paying attention to this. This is your, like, this is your CRM. If you're, you know, like for salespeople before there were CRMs, right? I, I think that that's the analogy there. It's not the new iPhone. It, it's not like broadband, right? It's not, it's not a paradigm shift. I'm convinced it's, it's a productivity increase, which, which we need right now. If we need to grow GDP, uh, you know, to pay for this, the constantly growing deficit that we're going to monetize through through inflation. The only way to grow out of that is productivity increases, and and these things can provide that, right? But uh, it, I, I steadfastly believe AI, this whole technology, will create more jobs and more um, productivity than it will replace. Um, I mean, you know, you, you use this stuff, and it. Yeah, I mean, I, it create it's it's cool that a computer can do this, but you look at it and you're like, I don't know, like it looks like if I had to guess, a, a human middle schooler created this, right? And then, sorry, that's just not valuable. And to your point, about, like manipulating images or writing poems or whatever, great. There's no commercial value in that. There never has been, right? Like photo editors, not a big industry, right? Yeah, uh, I, I love that uh, that take on there. As I've been trying to play around with a lot of this stuff, I found very few things really production ready. One of the few things being Firefly's AI, which is a note taking program that you can invite into your Zoom calls and it will write down and take notes of what people said and then email it to all the participants. That's really useful. But I wasn't hiring a person to do that before. Yeah. Nobody <laughs> was. That shit's been around for like six years, right? It's like, right. yeah, you, that, more importantly, we weren't hiring people to do that. So who gives a shit? One. And two, yeah. like, that's not new, right? Right, exactly. So this is just... Kind of the latest craze that uh, is really just a distraction. We won't get into from what, but long story short, not a whole lot to worry about right now. Agreed. So as we you know try and get through the doldrums of this summer here, do you think we've hit a bottom in terms of where the markets are at? Not just the crypto markets, but the job market layoffs, or do you still think that we need some more pain to finally wrangle in inflation and then bring prices of assets down to a level where people are comfortable buying again. Yeah. So I, I you know, this, this is the, certainly the question of the day. And, um, you know, I, I have a couple of vectors I follow that, that help me think about the potential outcomes. I, cause I, I don't have, you know, no, no one can answer this like with, with, with super high conviction. There's no I mean, AI like, crystal ball yet. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, you have Dalio is, is convicted, you know, has conviction one way. And, you know, then, then there's plenty of other smart global macro guys that are taking the opposite bet. Right? It's like, how could this many smart people like be completely misaligned on a topic? Right. It's, it just makes it so fascinating. Global macro is so fascinating. So um, it feels like we are at the bottom and dragging along the bottom. And by the way, like 
interest rates drive risk on assets, drives crypto, right? It's all the same thing, essentially. They correlate to one on the way down and typically on the way up-ish. And so um, the only thing I think, you know, we have to keep a close eye on is this commercial real estate debt issue. You know, there's all these, so, you know, COVID causes the, the, the shutdowns, the shutdowns kill office space, remote work is born. Most people aren't going back to the office. Commercial rents adjust way down. The debt comes due. It's not serviceable anymore. The buildings go into foreclosure. You have in San, cities like San Francisco, I don't know, 40% vacant, vacancy rates, potentially more in five years. So you have all this debt coming to maturity that's being defaulted on. Where is it going to go? Fed's balance sheet. Who pays for that? Us, inflation, when the government monetizes debt. So are we? So I think that's a foregone conclusion that that happens. Who pays for it? Us, slowly through inflation. And um, I don't know, are we going to have a president that, you know, trims back and, and starts to close the deficit? I don't think so. That's, that's politically unpopular. So we are going to deal with more inflation. And um, how, how do you grow out of that? I think, you know, productivity, um, that kind of stuff. So AI and, and global innovation, you know, software, tech are still like, I'm convinced, part of the solution here. Um, but what, that, that could mean, I, I don't see anything getting better in the next four quarters. Uh, m- maybe it gets a little worse. Um, and then, I, I, yeah, the, then the cycle resets, right? And then, we, you know, you, you get the balance sheet back under control. We've the, the system has digested all of the toxic things. You know, hopefully, no more banks fail. But this commercial real estate things, uh, commercial real estate debt is an issue. I think in four or five quarters we could be seeing quantitative easing again, right? Because that's that's just the way these cycles go. So um, hopefully, hopefully it's the bottom though. I sure hope so too. And you know, just about everyone I'm talking to is kind of looking towards a, a turnaround. Hopefully by the end of this year. Um, but I think the scare you out phase is just about finished, but from there comes the wear you out phase where there's just months and months of nothing worse, but nothing getting better. So I hope that that's where we're at now. Um, because if you're experienced in these markets, you know, that is a good sign of things to come. And that's the time to start buying as an investor, not just a business owner, What are some things that you're looking at in terms of crypto sectors that you think might be able to outperform Bitcoin in this next run up ahead? Like, what are you looking towards? Yeah, I mean, I I don't look at crypto assets. I'm not a hedge fund manager, so I don't like I don't care about Bitcoin being a benchmark. I I think owning all the important things is what is what matters. So obviously, always owning Bitcoin makes a lot of sense. Ethereum. I've never been more bullish on Ethereum. It is is such an important platform. I think it's the it's the layer one to kind of move society forward and in all fiats and in in banking. You know, eventually consolidates to Ethereum. Um, and then I love things that create real world value, right? That you know that can disrupt high fee takers. Right now, obviously, Brain Trust aims to be in that category. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't like naming other names just you know, for for hygiene's sake. But but anything that's t- that's playing on that right end of the spectrum that I mentioned before, where it is disrupting entities that take disproportionate value from the networks they run, right? And so there's a handful of crypto networks that you know are aiming to do that. But I think I think we need to see more of that. Um, I'll, uh, the generic VC answer is like infrastructure, pick and shovel, right? And it, I don't know. Yeah. I just think that's simple. Like, what does that stats. even mean? I don't know. It, it, it's just, it's just, it's an intellectually bankrupt term that venture capitalists use because they don't understand technology. But it's like, okay, yeah, alchemy. We get it, right? They're like the AWS of of, uh, and they're awesome, right? amazing. Like you can count on one hand or less how many uh, companies are like that in the space. But um, you know, this is a, like an open source world here, right? I don't I actually don't think there's tons and tons of money in. The pick and act, picks and shovels. I think it is in the application layer that disrupts these high fee takers. That's another great uh, contrarian take. Love it. So, Ethereum, as you mentioned, um, they're going to be the settlement layer for banking at some point. I think when uh, Ethereum 2.0 was first announced, I said, that's it. Ethereum's gone corporate. It's not going to be this place where there's the next killer app. 
You know, you're not going to be having it be the settlement layer for gaming or any of this stuff. It's going to be used by large banks and world governments to settle really, really, really important things like peace treaties uh, or, you know, central bank digital currency exchanges between one another. Do you think that's an accurate vision or how do you think Ethereum transactions are really going to look in the next three to five years? Like it can't just be full of Pepe coins. Oh, my God. Or can it? I wish the fucking meme coins would go away. It's just so stupid. Um, so like settlement layer for gaming, I don't know. I, I don't know anything about gaming. I'm not sure gaming needs a settlement layer. It seems like games, games are bigger than movies and TV, right? And they've done fine without a blockchain. I don't, I don't get, I don't, I don't get it. But settlement layer for, how about this? All borrow lend. All borrow lend in the world should settle to Ethereum, right? Like when three arrows and, uh, BlockFi and all these other, you know, kind of unregulated nonsense machines went under because they don't know how to manage risk. Um, who still got paid back? Ave, Compound, right? The 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 to the the smart contract lending systems. You can build, you know, DYDX, right? Amazing infrastructure. You can build leverage on these things. You can build like uh, Figure, you know, originating and. Um, securitizing home loans using blockchain tech to shave 150 bips off every transaction. Wow. Now you're in a trillion dollar market, right? That shit matters. And that, 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 that goes, that settles to Ethereum in my mind. And then, and then application layers, right? Like use your own talent networks, use your own last mile networks, s settle to Ethereum because those networks need to be inherently trustless. So anyone can participate and some, someone asleep at the wheel and risk management can't screw the whole thing up. Yeah, absolutely. Now, as we head into 2024, you know, somewhere down the line, I'm not convinced that gas fees are going to be affordable for the average person. And we're looking at layer two solutions for our everyday DeFi trading, borrow and lend from an average user perspective, you know, where we're not taking out millions of dollars of loans that, you know, if you're paying a few hundred dollars in gas fees for something like that, who cares? That's still a tiny percentage. But if I want to borrow $250 and the gas fee is more than that, it doesn't work. And the idea of DeFi is to create financial inclusion for people that don't have any access to financial services. Someone in India or the Philippines aren't going to even be able to afford to pay a $10 gas fee transaction. That's completely insane for them. They might not even make that much money in a week. So what are some of the layer twos that might be of interest to you that you saw, you know, this still has the ethos of Ethereum and the structure of it, and it can settle on it layer. But I, would you feel comfortable using any of these L2s? Yeah, absolutely. So look, th this is the brilliance of the market dynamics that Vitalik and, and co have built into Ethereum, right? You know, first it's moved to proof of stake that, you know, or 1559, uh, you know, to, to make mining less extractive, uh, and essentially made Ethereum deflationary. That doesn't help fees. I get it, but it helps um, drive demand for the token. Second, um, proof of stake makes everything cheaper. Third will be sharding, which they're working on now. So that that should reduce fees again. But it'll never, to your point, it'll it'll never become everyday affordable, and it was never designed to. Which which is why Vitalik loves the L twos, right? He always talks about he's you know they're very compatible. Polygon obviously the clear runaway winner here. We're building on Polygon with Brain Trust obvious clear winner there, right? Um, there's other network, like there's an L2 called Scale, uh, which I, it's really popular for gaming. Totally EVM compatible. You move back and forth from ETH. Um, Arbitrum, uh, which I believe Coinbase's new thing, you know, new L2 is built on. That's on Optimism. Sorry, Optimism. Yeah, sorry. Um, and so Coinbase embracing open source L2s, like, look, that, it, it's clear that the EVM world is what we're going to move forward with here, right? It's, you know, Linux over over Windows essentially. And would you um, consider the L twos part of that application layer? Yeah, that you were talking about. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. I, it, it's yeah, the, it it can. It's it's like it's hosting, right? So maybe yeah, yeah. I guess not. It's not like kind of in the middle. It's hosting. I like Filecoin's another one, right? It's like storage. S three Amazon S three storage is expensive for what it is, right? And and there's and there's not you can't store on Ethereum. It's way too expensive, and so. Filecoin actually like super compelling what they've built 
for, for a decentralized, secure, high, uh, low latency, high availability storage system, cost-wise compared to S3, from what I've read, I'm not using it at scale, but from what I've been reading, and I've been involved in the project for a long time, um, it is, is very disruptive. So those, look, that, that to me is the future. Like these things, th- and these things are here. They're ready to go. They're working. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been really interesting seeing internet computer uh, being built by Dfinity starting to reach maturity and becoming uh, more than just hype. Like we're seeing a lot of stake to match the earlier sizzle that was surrounding them in the half a decade that it's taken them to build this stuff. But it includes compute, file storage, hosting, just about like a kind of an all-in-one quote-unquote smart contract platform that does all these other things as well. Has that been on your radar whatsoever? You know, I, I'm familiar with the project. I'm, I'm an LP in a couple of funds that that were you know directly involved in helping stand that up. I, I'm not. I'm not. I haven't used it, so I, I'm not an expert on it. Okay, I was just asking. I am not either. I don't hold any ICP. But I haven't used it yet, but I see more and more development on that platform every day, and it's got me curious. There's a Twitter account called Proof of GitHub that will you know dump the top 10 platforms that had code commits that day. So you can kind of track and see where the development is really happening right there in your Twitter feed. And I kind of equate that to, you know, skate to where, you know, the puck is going to be at next. And I'm constantly seeing stuff there. I'm seeing stuff on Cardano, Cosmos, Polkadot, and even, you know, lesser known things like status network and Vega protocol Uh, are just having hundreds and hundreds of commits every day. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, there's really a lot of stuff going on over here. I want to pay attention to that. Awesome. Well, Adam, before we let you go, what are some of your final thoughts, you know, just from a brain trust, you know, operator perspective, like what's next for you guys in growing that business, growing that community? Well, I'll, I'll tell you that the marketplace has really found product market fit Talent, love it. We went from 75,000 talent last November to th- over 300,000 today, uh, largely driven, you know, driven by tech layoffs and that kind of thing. So you know, there's enough supply on this network to drive billions of dollars of demand. This thing kind of grows itself with the token. It's re- really capital efficient. So our next, you know, our big shot on goal here, we've been working on for like a year, is this professional network, which, by the way, releases January, uh, June 8th wide release. It's been in private beta now with a bunch of people. So it's really getting a lot of use, but it's closed off still. Uh, that team will will generally release on, on June 8th. I think, you know, in a world where people need to reskill, people need mentorship, the, the advice you used to get at the water cooler from your senior manager, that doesn't happen anymore. There's no water cooler anymore. So I think this, this feature is building or filling a huge gap in the market and gives folks a, a good reason to come in and earn some brain trust tokens by referring their friends or their, or their client or their boss, and then upskill their career, right? There's no, no good, no good place to do that right now. And here you can essentially do it for free. So that's, that's what we're excited about. That's what we think will keep this network, you know, growing exponentially. I've got an idea for you that just came to mind and we're going to code name it auto Dow, where it's going to take talent on your network. That's looking for work. And depending on what their experience is, it's going to slot them into this simulated organization all the way from the top down. So they're working for this mock company with other people that are looking for talent to get hired. And then they can just have like an open community where they can maybe come up with an idea and work on something together in the meantime. So they're still being productive. They're keeping their skills fresh. They're showing employers that they're still hungry and ready to go. And for all they know, they may get snatched up by an investor rather than an employer and he just comes in and you know you got an investor okay i've got this uh you know funding boom here's my entire company that already has synergy and they can hire it that way what do you think about that that's cool it's like it's like a cross between an open source project and an incubator yeah right like i yeah that's kind of cool maybe we should uh put our heads together and start that that'd be amazing because what else is everyone else going to do just watch netflix (laughs) <laughs> There's not enough good let's, stuff let's, on Netflix. Let, no, not at all. Let, let's just build something cool together while we're waiting for a paycheck. And maybe that uh, paycheck will end up being founder shares instead. Who knows? I love it. Well, thanks for uh, being receptive to my insanity. 
Um, I get a good one every now and then. Well, let's, let's see what happens. But uh, Adam, can't wait to have you back on the podcast next time, another six months or a year from now. Or if you have any big major updates, just send us an email and you know, we'll book you again. It's a, thanks for having me. It's always good to see you, man. Feelings mutual. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week with another great podcast here at Crypto 101.